Thank you, Jeff. So hello, Hubbers. Welcome again to our webinars. So um, we are so lucky today because our speaker, she's very young. Grabe. Talagang ang bata-bata niya. Tsaka ang ganda-ganda pa. Pero <laughs> ano siya yung... Um, she came from the Philippines, but she grew up in England. So she had her bachelor's of science degree in biomedical sciences and first class honors. Grabe. England yun dong. <laughs> Ang galing galing. So then she, um, well, she did that it, at the University of Surrey in, at the United, in the United Kingdom. And then she went on to do her PhD in molecular pharmacology. And daming chemistry na yata noon. Nako, just ko. Anyway, Dawn, um, she worked on her PhD at Cardiff University School of Pharmacy sa England. And then nag, nag postdoctoral pa rin siya. And dami niyang ginawang postdoctoral positions. Um, so she went to the Institute of Cancer Research sa London at saka sa European Cancer Stem Cell Institute sa Cardiff, England. And then now she's working as a um, senior analyst um, at a consulting firm. It's called M Partners. Um, so he, she's doing consultation on various translational oncology researches. So now, um, wag na natin patagalin. I present to you Dr. Glory Ann Wike Lazaro. Hello, Glory. Come on in. Yeah. Hi, Glory. Um, you may on now mute. take. Yeah, she's on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm we now not... take the floor. Thank you, thank you again for inviting me. Let me share my screen if it works. All right. So once I oh, let me go. So once again, um, thank you, Dita Connie, for inviting me. Um, uh, yeah, I'm excited to share the work and um, that I've done and um, talk to you about cancer research and kind of, you know, the successes and the challenges of cancer research, as, you know, they mentioned earlier, na mahirap na um, gamotin na cancer because it's not just one disease. Um, I think there's over 200 tumor types there. Um, and if, you know, there's so many things like cancer cells become resistant and things like that. So we, I will try and hopefully um, share these views with you today. So as an outline for, for my talk, um, you know, kind of sharing my background, I mean, Dita Funny is already kind of giving you a flavor of what I've done, but I'll give you kind of, you know, a, a brief outline of what I've done in my career, an introduction into, into cancer, what is cancer, and then the tools and methodology that we use in cancer research, um, not all of them, but I'll give you a flavor in a man. And then cancer drugs um, and, you know, some cancer drugs and how they were discovered and, you know, how long it takes to actually go from a preclinical, so, you know, from, from, from the lab and taking that to, to clinical trials and then into humans. Uh, and then the challenges and nuances in cancer research. And then we'll close. Um, hopefully I'll be able to answer your question or not. We'll see. Um, so. My career to date, um, an introduction, as um, Tita Connie said, I started, well, I spent my time in the Philippines. I grew up there. I did my grade school there. Um, and then I moved to England. So I think my science kind of appetite was kind of started maybe in grade school. I was a member of the science club and we were doing all these experiments. Like, I don't know, back then it was like how to make soap and things like that. So I think being kind of hands-on was really my thing. And so I really enjoyed science. And then I moved to the UK in, in England um, and in high school. And I think in high school, I think what was like, you know, the biggest thing for me was, it was just happened, but DNA, DNA. And then in high school, I learned about RNA. Meron palang RNA, which is like the ribosomal nucleic acid. And I was like, whoa, mind blown. And so that's how I started getting interested in science. Like there's so many more things that I didn't know about, like my DNA, my RNA, my my, you know, there's so many things that you have that, that discovered that we can't even see, but we know so much about it. And so that's how that kind of spurred me to kind of pursue the bachelor's I have um, in biomedical science. So this is a university of Surrey. And then during my time at Surrey, um, I was fortunate enough to spend a year in my second year um, in Finland um, to work in a lab uh, in the Tourist Center of Biotechnology. 
And so this was my first flavor of um, taste of um, cancer research. So I was working on prostate cancer, um, you know, very early. I was just like this like kind of naive um, college student. I didn't know how to, I don't know what cells were. I didn't know how to hold the big bet. But I think that year really kind of, you know, spurred me to pursue a PhD. And so I was working on a protein um, in Finland called FAC. So it's a focal addition kinase. And then I really wanted to work on that protein. Like I was obsessed with that protein. So I made sure I found a lab that was working on that protein. And so then that I found that lab um, at Cardiff. Um, so then I worked, I did my PhD there, kind of working on focal adhesion kinase, the FAC protein I was working on uh, in breast cancer. Um, and then after my PhD, I stayed in the same city. I did my postdoc at the Cancer Cell and Stem Cell Institute, um, kind of working on different drug, different ways that you can screen drugs more effectively. And then I did it. I, I moved to the city in London. I uh, did a postdoc again, Institute of Cancer Research. And then finally, um, I have now a consultant for um, EM Partners. So we advise kind of pharma companies on how to develop drugs, how to pursue their clinical trials and things like that. And then I'll move on. So firstly, introduce Nathan. What is, you know, the cancer statistics. So cancer, I think, is very close to everyone's um, heart. It's something that I know, I'm sure everyone knows someone, be it a family member, be your friend, or someone that has been affected um, by cancer. So we know worldwide, I mean, in 2018 alone, um, 17 million cases of, of cancer, um, 9.6 million deaths. And unfortunately, um, a third of cancer um, is linked um, in exposure to tobacco um, worldwide. And the most common uh, is breast, lung, colon, rectal, and uh, prostate cancer. So again, as I said, you know, a third of cancer is due to tobacco use, high BMI. So, you know, medio mabigat. Um, alcohol consumption and, you know, low fruit and vegetable intake and then lack of physical activity. So again, um, and I think in the Western world or maybe I think worldwide now, um, the statistics have changed. It used to be, I think, one in three are expected to be diagnosed with cancer, but now this has changed. Now it's actually one in two. So it's, it's a sad fact. And so this is why we really need um, research efforts um, to identify new drugs, uh, new targets for, for cancer. So ano ba cancer? What is cancer? So in the most like kind of simplistic way um, of explaining it, it's the uncontrollable abnormal growth of cells. So if you think this is a normal cell, you know, well-behaved, and then they kind of slowly grow and then they form this tumor. And so here in the middle, oh, well, let me put my, ano. I'm using my pointer, wala nung palang laser. Can you, okay, I can, you can see my laser now. <laughs> um, so this is in blue, uh, a healthy cell. And then here in pink is, is a cancer cell. So very obvious the amount of differences um, between a normal and a cancer cell. So the shape um, of the nucleus of a cancer cell is much bigger. Um, and some of them, you know, have a large cytoplasm. Um, a lot of them, they divide uncontrollably. And sometimes they kind of have this, the phenotype na maraming paa or like um, what you call it like a very kind of they want to invade they want to migrate and so that's when have they acquire this um, characteristic na gusto mag metastasize so that's a characteristic of cancer cells as well uh, again and loss of normal features or poorly defined boundaries as you can see here as well dito well behaved sila magkatabi sila very friendly very cozy and then when you start you know becoming a cancer cell then they, they don't want to be friends anymore. They want to move. They want to kind of be mobile and they just want to spread around the body. So that's, that's what's a cancer cell, essentially. And so then if I move my next slide. So this is something that I think I would refer everyone to if you're a budding cancer um, research scientist. Um, so this is a go-to read. Uh, this is a paper um, that was published in 2000. Uh, it's the Hallmarks of Cancer um, by Bob Weinberg and Douglas Hanahan. I was lucky enough to actually meet um, Bob Weinberg um, in a conference back when I was in Finland. So I was kind of starstruck as well. And so I think that was like, okay, I really need to pursue cancer research. Uh, and so this, um, they proposed basically six hallmarks 
um, of abilities. So basically characteristics that a normal cell will have to acquire that defines um, that, they take, that, that dictates them to transform into a cancer cell. Uh, and so this was published in 2000. And because of the efforts and the breadth of research in the last three years, this has been updated now, 2011. They've added four new hallmarks of cancer. So it's so if, if in 2000, it was like, you know, cells need to sustain the proliferative signaling. Um, they need to really divide and things like that. We'll touch on this and explain a little bit more about this later on. Uh, so in 2011, because of more research, more kind of efforts from, from you know, labs, they've added more hallmarks of cancer. And then in 2022, if I move again, um, so yeah, um, they've added more as well. And so this, they have more updates on the hallmarks of cancer. And so if I review all of this today, I think we'll be here for like months because this in itself is like a module in like a university course. So, so we won't do that, but we'll try and review two of them. So um, what, uh, the hallmark, one hallmark we'll review is sustaining proliferative signaling and obeyon, and then activating invasion metastasis. So this is what I was talking about earlier. You mga cells na parang they acquire these legs and feet, and then they want to move away from the tumor and spread. And so how did they acquire that um, kind of um, characteristic? So if I move, beyond. So first we'll review one, the first hallmark of cancer is um, how to sustain um, the proliferative signaling. So here on the top left is, is a bit more complicated. So I'm gonna try and simplify this one here. So this is a cell, as I'm sure you would all recognize. Um, so a cell will have a nucleus and the nucleus will dictate how the cell behaves um, to divide and grow. So a cell will usually have on the cell surface um, receptors, so para mga antenna, and then they receive signals from the outside, and then they will transmit those signals into these um, proteins in, like inside the cell, and then ultimately, magsisenya ng signal sa nucleus to, kind, to, to, to direct the cell to divide and grow. So that's what happens in a normal cell. Um, very healthy, and they kind of maintain this state of homeostasis. So homeostasis is a kind of self-regulatory state of the cell to maintain balance. Um, but then what happens in cancer? Um, Medyo naging crazy sila, di ba? So this is a cancer cell. So this normal cell and this is cancer cell. So I'll try and talk to you what happens uh, and what makes a cancer, what, what enables them to, to grow like, you know, uncontrollably. So the here, if you can see, I'm gonna click on um, Firstly, we'll talk about overexpression of the receptors. So it's a normal cell. If you can see mga antenna na ito, let's say, for example, dalawa lang sila. So in a cancer cell, you can have an overexpression of these receptors. From two, you can have thousands to millions of these. So in effect, pag marami kang antenna, di marami kang signal. So you have, um, you can receive more signals to grow. So that's what happens with cancer. Another, um, another hallmark is this, what we call autocrine signaling. So in a normal cell, um, they will rely on these growth factors. Ito yung mga, yung mga messages um, from external environment. But in a cancer cell, they have devised a way na they can make their own growth factors. So basically, they'll, they're self-reliant na sila. So they will, they, will, they will synthesize, they will make these growth factors, release them, and then that's going to be the message for the, for the antenna, yung mga receptors nila. And so basically, yeah, it's, it's self-regulating, self self-sustaining, so that's one hallmark as well. This is how they maintain, um, have, how they keep growing. And then, and then um, another one is this disruption of the negative feedback loop. So what does that mean? So usually uh, if cancer is, you know, my growth factor, my signal, na let's grow. My, um, and then the nucleus will also send a signal back to this um, proteins to switch off. I say that's that's how it should be. Like you can, so it may, may negative feedback loop. But in cancer, you actually lose this negative feedback loop. So that's another kind of hallmark. And then another one is um, ligand independent activation. So there are certain mutations in the receptor 
um, that perhaps, you know, it change the shape ng receptor. So they're not, no longer responsive sa mga growth factors na ito na nakalutang dito. And so kind of like hyperactivation of these receptors. So again, pag hyperactivated ng receptors, um, they constantly fire these signals um, sa loob ng cell. And again, that's gonna dictate the cells to, to grow um, uncontrollably. And then finally, um, another one is the deregulated signaling circuitry. So again, pwede rin mag-commutations itong mga messengers dito sa loob. They can, and sometimes they, they no longer become independent. They become independent from the receptor. So they can just be hyperactivated as well. Um, so again, that's another kind of hallmark of, of cancer. And then another hallmark I, I wanted to talk about is the activation of migration, invasion, and metastasis. But before we go to details of that, um, this is just a kind of brief schematic on to show you how cancer spreads. Um, so as you know, you have the primary tumor. Um, the, the main cause of mortality of cancer is when they spread to um, distant organs. Uh, metastasize, and that's usually like causing the high morbidity of, of cancer. Uh, so how the cancer spreads. So this is, the, let's say, the primary tumor of the cancer. So what they need to do is they have to enter the bloodstream. So to, 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 to what you call it, invade the bloodstream. And then they have to travel along the bloodstream. And you know, it's a very hostile environment. But I mean, traffic, blood cells, immune cells traveling. So they really have to survive this um, this busy this busy road, and then eventually leave that bloodstream, and then hone into the distant sites. So so they have to do this. Have to go from from the the, the primary tumor site, pass off the bloodstream, and then go outside, and then spread to a distant site. So that's how a a a tumor spreads. And so this is what happens on like a, a cellular level, and uh, it's another hallmark of cancer. So again, this is the complicated version, but I'll try and simplify this uh, for you guys. So again, here in, in, in blue cells, so these are the normal cells. And then in red here are the cancer cells. So in the blue cells, again, nice shape, nice little nucleus. And you have these, um, what we call cell-to-cell -cell adhesion molecules. Um, they're called cadherins. And so, you know, nice and attached, they like to be close to each other. And then what happens but um, cancer, they want to metastasize and invade to the distant sites. Um, firstly, um, so they lose these cell, to cell adhesions, so the cadherin. So actually, they, 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 they downregulate um, their expression of these proteins called cadherin. So they're no longer like, you know, nicely cozy attached to each other. Um, and then they also start expressing um, these receptors. They're called integrins. Um, so these are in blue, yung parang hooks dyan. Um, so these enable them so to actually kind of be more sticky and bind to their environment. So you know, it's like, as I said earlier, they gain these legs and feet, so they, they move a little bit more. Uh, and then they form these focal adhesions. So these are like the pointy things here. So again, it's like hands and feet uh, and invader polyas as well. So ultimately enabling the cancer cell to be able to move. Uh, and so this is what happens. And then meh, they also start expressing enzymes. Um, they're called metalloproteases. And so what does that do? So these enzymes will degrade this basement membrane. So if you imagine yung picture kanina, so they will start to degrade this. Um, and then, so that's, you know, para makapasok sila sa bloodstream and then move to distant sites. So yeah, these are just a few. It's not like, I mean, it's a more complicated process, but I hope you appreciate that it's, it's a dynamic process and it's, it's, it's a hostile environment. And so cancer cells really have to go through a lot just to, to metastasize. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tough world out there for, I know, for cancer cells. I moved Molana. So how do we study this um, in the lab? Um, how do we study um, lab? It's a lab based. So what I've done is, you know, a lab based kind of cancer research. Um, so what do we do in the lab? So we need there's two types of samples we can we can use. So in vitro, 
um, so cancer cell lines, and in in vivo. So in vitro in Latin it actually means um, in glass, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so this is the most common. Um, so this is um, cell. These are cells taken from um, uh, cancer patients historically, uh, and then they've kind of modified it so they become immortal. So they're kind of they will divide um, in, indefinitely, basically. So you can use them in the lab. Most labs in the world will have them. Um, yeah, so they can be cultured indefinitely and used in cancer labs globally. And if you go into you know cancer research, one of the most famous cancer cell is is called the HeLa cell. And so this is actually from a lady called Henrietta Lacks. So this is a really good book if you want to read about cancer cell lines. Um, so she was, I think, born in 1920 and she died in 1950 of cervical cancer. Um, and they've taken her cells, modified it, and actually it's now one of the most common um, cancer cell line used in the labs um, um, globally. Uh, and then um, the next model that we can use to study cancer is um, in vivo animal models. So mice, rats, rabbits, I think they can do dogs as well, but um, these are the things that at least I have worked with with mice. Um, so this mice is different because it don't sell stuff, but this is an entire living organism, so a different environment. Um, and so this um, is better because as you can imagine in, in, a, in a dish, it's only cells. It's not really representative of how a tumor is inside a human body. So this is kind of the next level up. Um, animal models. Um, ang down, ang, ang, ang disadvantage nito is it's very expensive. Um, I think if I remember when I was doing mice work, it was 50 pounds per mice, which I don't know how much that is in pesos. Maybe it's like 2000. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but it's very expensive. Uh, and it's slow throughput but again the the the, the answers the, the question and the answers that you get from 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 using animal models um are you know very different to to what you can get from from just using cells uh, in the lab so the, yeah this is a cell and this is a cute little mice but there's different types of mice as well um but yeah cool uh and then what do you need so the basics of a lab for 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 cancer research uh, what tools do you need? As I said earlier, so firstly, you need the study sample, the cells that you work with or the animal models. But how do you actually start studying? How do you kind of culture these cells um, in the lab? So firstly, you need um, tissue culture plates and flasks here um, so to grow and um, to grow the cells. Uh, and then you need some culture media. So this is basically their nutrients. It's a soup. It contains nutrients, proteins, amino acids, and everything that you need for the cells to keep growing. Um, so, you know, we use different types of culture media for different types of tumor cells. Um, some of them are, you know, kind of okay lang kung glucose or something. And then some of them are a bit more um, high maintenance is, is what we, we call you. You, had, you have to have more growth factors in them, things like that. So you have to optimize the soup um, to enable these cells to grow um, happily. Uh, then you need also a humidified um, um, chambers because hey, you, you can't just leave the cells on a desk. They will just die because, you know, it's, it's going to be cold and things like that. So you need to, this is a humidified chamber. So this will maintain an atmosphere for the cells, um, a constant atmosphere, 5% uh, CO2 and 37 degrees um, Celsius. And then finally, you need kind of how to work with these cells um, to keep them sterile. Uh, you need some kind of laminar flow hood. So you see these people. I'm sure you've seen this in like, I don't know, movies and things like that, the sci-fi movies, uh, when people work with these gloves and things like that. Um, so this enables you to work with these cells in a sterile environment. So to avoid any contamination with um, bacteria, fungus, um, yeast, and things like that. So that, these are just the basics. I mean, there's a lot more tools that you can use but I just wanna give you a flavor of what, what, what we use in the lab. And so more kind of tools and methodologies that we use for, for cancer. So again, earlier, sinabi ko na, you can, you know, to, to cancer cell proliferation is a hallmark of cancer. And so how do we study that um, in the lab? There's different methods. I'll share three with you today. Um, so one is called an MTS assay. 
so MTS, it's kind of, it's a substrate um, that will change color um, pag na metabolize siya ng cells na nabuhay. So not dead cells, but only live cells will metabolize this MTS. And when they metabolize, they form this um, formazan dye product. And that's what you see here. It's like a purple dye. And so what happens is, what well, you see is like the more cells you have, the more live cells you have, the darker it is. The, the more the low the, the the least the the least cells the less cells you have to lose in English the less cells you have um, the lighter the color so that's that kind of is a surrogate for um, cell proliferation and then another is what we call the tripan blue assay so tripan blue is is a dye um, it, you use the color again the life and the dead cells so um, this is basically pag buhay ang cell, um, they won't take in the dye because they have the, the, the cell membrane is intact. But, pag, but when the cells are dead, they will take in the dye. So here you are, they're, they're blue um, because you, know, you, you, you lose the integrity of the cell membrane when you're, when you're a dying cell. And so that's how you kind of distinguish. You can kind of work out the proportion of live cells versus dead cells. And that's how you work out um, how much um, the cells are growing. And then finally, this is what we call the cell titer glow assay. Um, so this is a bit more complex and slightly more expensive. Um, it detects um, ATP. So I don't know if you've, you've, had, you've, you've heard of ATP in your kind of science lessons and things like that. Um, so this is kind of the um, energy currency of, of the cell. Um, so it's adenosine triphosphate. And again, so this is a substrate that you add to a plate. And again, the more ATP the cell has, um, the more alive they are. The less ATP, the more dead they are, basically. And so again, you can kind of see um, the, the effect of, of, of the drugs um, on, on cells through these methods. And then what you do is, you know, you, you do these cells, you plate them out, um, and then you, you, you read them. Uh, and then you can start analyzing the data. Um, so this is, oh, uh, so this is um, an experiment that I did. So this, these are um, breast cancer cells um, treated with two types of drugs. So DMSO here is the control, and you can see here um, increasing doses of the drug from 0 0.25 micromolar. You increase the dose, you can see that the cells are dying. So again, this is from using a tripe and blue assay actually. Um, so, you know, control cells, very much alive. And as you treat the cells with the drug, um, slowly na mamatay na sila. Um, and you can graph this out. And this is how we present things um, in a paper or in a, in a conference. Uh, so, yeah. The next, I think, so we talked about how to detect cancer perforation. The next thing is how we study cancer cell migration or invasion. This is what I mentioned earlier when, when, when cells acquire these legs and feet to move out and metastasize um, into distant organs. And so one method is what we call the wound scratch assay. Um, so you have these monolayers, so single layer of cells in a Petri dish. Um, and then you basically take a pipette and you scratch a line in the middle. Uh, and then um, you'll, 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 you'll observe how they kind of migrate towards each other. And so then you can add a drug or something, anything you want um, to see if it actually stops this, this, this wound healing process. And so and that's kind of indicative now, you know, um, it may actually suppress or um, inhibit um, metastasis. Um, so this is very cheap. This is very easy. Um, and you can, you just need a light microscope. And um, so, yeah, so this is something that I think this is well established. I think this was developed in the eighties. And so I think a lot of labs still use this, but um, you, we, people have moved as well um, to kind of more complex um, systems. Um, this is what we call the transwell Boyden chamber. So essentially it's a, a little well, um, you have the cells here on top, and then you have a membrane, maraming butas, and then you kind of add the media, the, the soup na I was talking about earlier, 
Uh, and then you allow the cells to migrate um, onto the other side of the membrane. And then you can actually count the number of cells here. Uh, and then to see you know, if, if the drug, if you add a drug on top, does that inhibit um, migration of these cells towards the other side? So again, that's another system that we use to study um, cancer cell migration or invasion. And these are the kind of data that you can get from these experiments. So this is from a Boyden chamber assay. And so you can see you can stain these cells that na move sa ilalim ng membrane. So you can stain them and you can count them. I mean, by eye if you really want to, but you can use um, a computer to actually like um, quantitate this. Um, and so you can see this is just um, a cell line that we that you inhibit um, a specific protein and you can quantitate this. And you can see here, this is the control at the top. And at the bottom, you, you, you inhibit this protein called MECP2. And you can actually see it's obvious that, you know, maraming cells of control. And then here, if you inhibit this protein, um, konti na lang. So konti na lang migrate from here to here because we inhibited this, this protein. So that's just an example of how we, we can kind of quantify this assay uh, and show um, the effect of some drugs on cancer cell migration and um, invasion. Uh, another technique we use uh, is immunofluorescence microscopy. And so this is widely used to assess both localization. So saan, um, where, in the, where in the cell are the, the proteins are and how much they are, um, how, how much they're being expressed. Um, so here, I guess I said, this is, if you remember the picture I showed earlier, you migrating cell. Um, so this, how you do microscopy, again, you plate the cells on a, on a cover slip, you add your treatment, and then you stain them with antibodies. So this is kind of the, the cross section, no slide. Um, so you have the cells here, and then you add the antibodies, um, and the antibodies are actually conjugated or you know attached to this thing called a fluorophore. So this fluorophore, when excited by a laser, will emit um, a light, um, specific wavelength, um, they will emit, and that's when you see color, and you can visualize that in, in a microscope. So kind of really a technique that, you know, widely used now, um, moving away from, from, from light microscopy, people are using confocal, this immunofluorescence microscopy um, to visualize um, cells. And so how, so what kind of data do we get out of this? Um, so this is something that I've done like years ago. I don't remember how long anymore. Um, so these are breast cancer cells. Um, these are the control cells. So imagine if you remember earlier, I told you that, you know, well-behaved, attached. So this is what they are. Um, so this is FAC, the protein that I was very interested in. Um, here very well on the side, you know, nice and compact cells. And then we add this um, growth factor called heregulin. And you can see, I mean, I'm sure even if, you know, if you don't know much about like cancer cell mutation, it's very obvious to man that you can see that cells start to separate from each other. And they start forming these focal adhesions, yung mga paa at mga kamay, and they start moving away from each other. And then I was working on this, this drug, um, PF878 from Pfizer um, at the time. And when you add this drug, to this, you can see that it almost um, reversed that kind of process. So, you know, dikit dikit na naman sila, and they have this, this let's say, kind of normal um, look. And so that's how you kind of use immunofluorescence to understand how drugs work and how they affect the, the, the protein and um, in cells. So that was good. And then you can take it the next level up as well. You can do multiple colors, it's a rainbow. So I really enjoyed this part of research because I really enjoyed art as a kid. And when I realized I can do this, I was like, I'm just going to do this all the time. Like it's, it's like, it's like painting. Um, so this one is you can do multiple colors um, if you want to detect different kind of proteins. So you use um, different antibodies that make different fluorophores. So let's say this one is for the green color and then the other one is for the red, yeah, green and red, the, the red color. So different proteins. And again, same thing here. I don't want to explain all the science behind it, but you can see this is the control cells, um, nice and 
separate yung two proteins na I was interested in, PAC and STAT3. And then when you add the growth factor again, heregulin, um, they start overlapping with each other. They become orange. Um, so green plus red, they become orange. And then when you add the drug that I was working on, um, the PF878, they go back to being separate. So again, this was a clue on how this drug actually works on stopping that my, um, invasion of the cell, that, that migration invasion of the cell. So again, you can use this technology to understand the mechanism on, on how your drugs affect um, the cancer cells. That's cool. So moving on from what we do in the lab and the techniques we use in the lab, um, cancer drug development. So how um, we develop cancer drugs and how this has evolved over time from the early 50s up till now. Um, so firstly, the most common, and I'm sure you've heard of this, uh, is chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is a systemic therapy. Systemic being you inject it in the blood and it kind of circulates uh, your whole body. And they will effectively kill anything in their way, like anything. So they will kill not just the cancer cells, which are here are in red, but also the normal cells. So this is why you have these severe side effects because chemotherapy is not specific. They will kill anything in their way. And so this is why you get, you know, in, in patients, you have hair loss and things like that, like um, really low blood count. They will kill that. They will kill your hair follicles and things like that. So, so this, is, this is chemotherapy. Historically, and it's still very, very much used today, um, chemotherapy, but more and more research. Um, so we moved on as well from chemotherapy. Um, now we have what we call targeted therapy and immunotherapy. So firstly, targeted therapy, um, hopefully it's obvious in the name, it will only target the, the, the cancer cells, but not the healthy cells. So these target the proteins required for cancer cell growth, survival, and metastasis. So, and it leaves the healthy normal cells un untouched. So examples of this, um, sure, hopefully, I don't know if you've heard of these drugs, um, erlotinib, which is used in lung cancer, Herceptin, which is used in breast cancer, uh, Avastin, which is used in many, many types of cancer, breast, lung, colorectal, and things like that. Uh, and then this is a kind of new kid on the block, immunotherapy. Um, I think you may, you may have heard this buzzword around. Um, so immunotherapy does not kill or like touch any of the cell, the, the tumor cells or the normal cells. What they do is they affect the immune cells. Immune cells, natin, you know, as you know, um, they will fight um, the infection and things like that. So the immune cells are also capable of fighting and killing the tumor cells, but we need to help them. And so we need to have drugs that activate the immune system to essentially kill the tumor cells. And so the downside of this, this is very expensive and it has a different set of side effects as well. Very different from a chemo, very different side effects from a targeted therapy. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a unique, unique set of side effects as well. And most common um, in use now is what we call pembrolizumab and evolumab. Um, so these are the most, I'd say, what we call the blockbuster um, immunotherapy um, in the clinic today. And so this is now the modern era of cancer drug development. We're still using chemotherapy, but we're moving away from that because of the side effects. Uh, and now we're moving towards targeted therapy uh, and immunotherapy. And so just to give you an example of targeted therapy, I think this is a good segue onto, onto drug development. I'll talk about um, Herceptin. So this is a drug for HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, so Herceptin, Oh my God, Bali spelling go. Herceptin is a monoclonal, it's an antibody that targets the HER2 receptor. So if you remember yung diagram kanina, that's the nucleus and yung mga antenna dito, these are the receptors. So this can easily be a HER2 receptors in a breast cancer cell. So HER2 was discovered way, way back then, before I was even born. Um, 1984, this was discovered by Bob Weinberg, the guy who wrote that paper hallmarks of cancer. So he's pretty big. I think he's still, still alive. I think he's still alive. Um, so he, he discovered that. And then in 1986, um, 
Slamon and Ulrich, so again, two scientists um, in California, I don't remember, um, so pursued the hypothesis that HER2 plays a role in breast, uh, in breast cancer. And so they found out that, you know, this, this HER2 sits on the surface of breast cancer cells. So these are receptors. Um, and then in normal breast cancer cells, they, they've realized that, you know, there's 20,000 HER2 receptors, but in a breast cancer cell, there are up to 2 million HER2 receptors that sits on the surface. So again, this is what, you know, overexpression of, of the receptor. And up to 20% of breast cancer um, are HER2 positive. So they, they have this overexpression of the HER2 receptor. And then they thought, okay, we need to discover, you need to treat this patient and how you develop a drug for, 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 for HER2. So they approached a pharma company called Genentech um, back in the day in, in Talton Frisco in California, which is now part of Roche um, to support their promising you know, experiment. But as in, lang, lang sila. support was not forthcoming. But then after a few years, the mother of a senior, the, 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 the mother of a, the VP uh, in Genentech was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so this kind of sort spurred the, 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 the research and the, the excitement to actually explore, you know, developing a drug for, for her too. And so that's when it started in the early 90s. Um, the trials for her for her septin, phase one, the phase two trials were conducted, um, then the phase three uh, in the late 90s, and eventually in the early 2000s, um, um, her septin was approved for metastatic breast cancer. And then five years later, it was approved for early. Um, breast cancer, so non-metastatic um, breast, breast cancer. So this is Herceptin. Uh, this is the receptor, major complicated version of aking antenna dito. And this is the, the antibody. This is Herceptin. It binds to the, the outside of the receptor uh, and, and blocks the, the signaling uh, pasok sa cell. Um, so again, this is, it just shows you that, you know, you don't just discover a drug and then you take it to the clinic the next day. It takes years and years and years of development from its discovery to you know knowing anong ginagawa niya sa breast cancer developing the antibody clinical trials it takes it took two decades for her set for her to um for, for from discovery um until like her septin was was available um as a treatment for for breast cancer patients and so that hopefully is a good segue to drug development so if you pursue a career in drug development, you would see many, 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 many versions of this um, timeline, this kind of image. Um, so this kind of highlights um, the, the timeline um, of drug development from the discovery, to the preclinical, so before it enters human studies. So this is you know, where the research, intense research, um, is involved, like where I've been involved in as well. Uh, and then it enters clinical trials. So there are three phases of a clinical trials, um, phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, usually phase one, um, they test a drug in a very, very small number of patients, like 20 patients, um, not, not even patients, uh, yeah, 20 patients. And then when they move to phase two, maybe like 100 patients. And then in phase three, they really want to test, you know, if the drug is efficacious in a larger population so you can test the drug in thousands of patients. And then eventually they will file um, for an approval with um, the regulatory um, company in the US as the FDA, in, in Europe it's the EMA. Um, and then hopefully, fingers crossed, they're happy with your study, um, they'll approve the drug. But again, this is a lengthy process and this costs money. So, um, it, yeah, from bringing a single drug from the bench, so from the lab to the bedside, so into humans and into patients is very expensive. And it's approximately, I think for one drug alone, this was, a, this was to 2020, I think, the stats is two to $3 billion. So from one drug, from like your 10,000 candidates, um, it takes billions of dollars to get that into the clinic. Um, so, and, and this is an interesting fact as well. So only one in 5,000, uh, one, yeah, only one in five to 10,000 um, prospective can anti-cancer agents receives the FDA approval and only one in 10 um, drugs that enter the phase one actually get approved 
um, in, 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 yeah, in the regulatory process. And so why is that? Bakit, bakit ang, ang, uh, why is it that um, the, the failure rate is very high? Um, and so there are nuances in, in cancer drug discovery. And hopefully I'll be able to kind of show you some of them. And so one of them is the limitations of, of 2D culture. So earlier I was talking to you about, you know, cancer cell lines and how we grow them in these little flasks and things like that. Um, but if, if you can imagine a tumor in your body um, is actually not cells on a dish in a flat. They're actually in 3D, um, more like a ball of cells attached to your kind of bloodstream. And so they're very different architectures. So in 2D, as I said, they, 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 they're monolayer, um, they grow flat. Um, so, and they attach the bottom in a plastic. So it's not really like kind of the normal environment of a tumor cell. Um, also, um, if you grow them on a dish, they have unlimited access to the nutrients. Um, so, you know, they, they, grow, they grow in a dish with the soup that I was talking about, that kind of full of um, proteins and glucose and things like that. Um, but that's not how re it really is in, in, a, in, a, in the body. So if you can imagine here, this is a 3D um, tumor. So if in a three meters, you, you mga cells sa loob, you say, sagit, sagit na, um, will, you, you know, won't be able to access the nutrients, but the cells on the outside do. And why is that important? Because that actually affects how drugs, uh, how cells respond to, to drugs. And so that's the limitation of, of, of 2D uh, culture is that, you know, we, historically, that's how we, we, we discover drugs. We, we test them on this monolayer of cells on a Petri dish. But actually, you know, we, we now with more research, um, I think, uh, you know, we're seeing that maybe a 3D culture is definitely a more, more representative of the tumor architecture um, in the body. And so these are, you know, this is kind of the work I've done as well is culturing cells um, in 3D. Um, so here, I'll show you an example of what I was talking about, how they respond to drugs differently. Um, so these are breast cancer cells, they're called BT474. Um, so I called for them 2D and then in 3D. So you see here, well, spheres. And then when you, and I treated these cells um, with, with drugs. Um, so this C is control. Uh, and then in dark, uh, in black is 3D, uh, and then in light gray is 2D. So if you focus perhaps on like the first here, if you, if you grow cells in 2D, the control cells, and you treat them with a drug T, stress to tamoxifen, um, you can see, let's say from 100%, the tamoxifen kills them by 50% when you grow them in 2D. But then when you grow them in 3D, so in dark, so from 100% to here, they actually only kill them by, let's say, uh, 30%. So you can see the differential um, sensitivity of these cells when they grow, they're grown in 2D versus 3D culture. So that's how it is back then. They were treating these cells on 2D thinking, oh my God, like an effective non-drug go, as in it kills the drugs. But actually in reality, when you take these these molecules, these, these drugs into a human, um, it's not as effective. And so this is why the drug failure rate um, um, in the clinical trials is quite high because and that, there's so many candidates that, that go in to, pre, to clinical trials, but actually they're not effective. They think it's really good, but yeah, they fail to, to show efficacy in, in patients. Um, and one of them is the fact that we, we don't have we didn't have the right um, model system to, to, to culture these, these cancer cells. And so that's one of the drawbacks or the nuances in, in drug development, but you know, there's progress and we are working um, towards bettering these, these models. Um, so this is basic 3D culture. And now we also have co-cultures. So as you can imagine, I showed you a very reductionist view of the tumor, tumor cells, healthy cells. But again, in reality, when in, in the body, it's not just tumor cells. 
um, they are surrounded by other cells. So fibroblasts, immune cells, endothelial cells, T cells. So there's lots of things to this. Um, so these also influence the, um, the, the sensitivity of these drugs, the sensitivity of these cells to, to drugs. And it's very difficult to kind of grow all these cells in, in, in a small dish. Um, but we are a step forward. Um, so these are cultured, co-culture cells. Um, so in red, yung mga cancer cells, and then in green are fibroblasts. So I think, you know, cult culturing cells, very early stages um, of, of, of development, but I think, you know, we're getting there. We're, we're able to, to co-culture at least two different types of cells in a dish, but ideally you want like everything in a dish, which, you know, is, we still need to uh, optimize, uh, but there is progress. Uh, and then another kind of model that we're using is what we call PDX. So these are patient derived xenografts. So these are where tissue or cells from a patient's tumor are implanted into immunodeficient mice. So wala silang immune system. So they can take in any foreign um, cells um, and they will just happily grow the cells because they don't have an immune system. Um, uh, and allowing for the, the a natural cancer progression. So you can actually see in a whole organ, in a whole um, animal, um, how cancer progresses. So this is a better model, but as I said earlier, um, in vivo mice work is very expensive. It's like, yeah, thousands per mice. Um, but again, it's a different kind of answer to your question as well, a bit more representative. Um, so this is kind of um, a work I've done as well. Um, so taking cells from directly from a patient tumor, um, and then you grow them in these 3D, what we call spheroids. So these are the spheroids we grow. And then you can treat them with different drugs, test them, how they grow these little 3D cultures. And then after that, you, you inject it back to a, a mice and, and then you let the tumors grow. And then you can kind of, you, you, you treat the mice with a drug and you see how it affects um, um, the tumor growth. And so this is, as I said, expensive. It takes a long time for a mice to kind of grow the tumor. It takes about six months. For the cells, I mean, these can take two weeks. Uh, uh, the 3D takes two weeks. These can just take a week or so. But if you talk about doing experiments in mice, they can take six months. So I was doing a postdoc, a one year postdoc after my PhD, and I was working with mice. And after six months, I, like, I had nothing to do the first three, four months. I was just waiting for tumors to grow in a mice. Like I was just reading and reading and reading. But yeah, so this one takes time. But again, um, answers different questions and it's more representative of, of, of the tumor um, in, in the human body. Another nuance in, in, in cancer drug development is resistance or that leads to relapse. So relapse being your cancer comes back. So in some patients, unfortunately, um, you know, you're, you're, you're clear of cancer, but 10, 20 years down the line, they come back. And that's a whole area, again, of research of why cancer comes back. Um, you know, understanding the mechanisms of resistance of cancer is, again, another module that we can talk about for hours and months. Um, it's just too much. Um, here we have four um, resist, resistant mechanism, and we'll talk to you about that earlier. But um, I'll just draw you to the graph here on the left. Um, so ideally, this is disease progression over time, so cancer progression over time. Um, and ideally, what you want for a treatment to be is to slowly kill, kill the tumor over time, long-term benefit, and it will never come back. But in reality, when you, when you treat cells, you, you kind of inhibit, you kill some cells, and so that one will kind of grow back again, and then you hit them with another drug, and then you, and so it's like you have this cycle of just going, um, treating, retreating, 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 retreating. And this is kind of very common um, in cancer. And there's a lot of research as well on understanding the mechanisms of resistance here and developing drugs for 
front line, first line, second line, third line, fourth line, I don't know, I, th I don't think they've stopped at fifth line um, um, treatment. But yeah, this is the, unfortunately the sad truth. And this is where, again, research needs to, needs to be um, understanding the mechanisms of, of resistance for cancer. And so today, again, I cannot talk about everything. Um, we'll touch upon two different resistance mechanisms. Um, one is alternative growth signaling or bypass signaling. And the other one is um, mutations or altered expression of the drug target. Mm -hmm. yeah. So first is this bypass, alternative bypass growth signaling. So again, this is the complex version that I will try and simplify. So here we are again. We meet the cancer cell in red. Um, here's the receptor, your antenna. Uh, let's go back to the HER2, yung, yung breast cancer um, receptor that we were talking about earlier. Um, so we know that Herceptin, the drug that um, was developed from 1984 up till 2000, the 20 year development drug Herceptin, um, has been developed to inhibit or target the HER2 receptor. So the HER2 receptor, we know, um, signals downstream. Um, so these two proteins, which is called the RAS, MAP kinase, MAP K protein, um, this is the pathway. They will signal to the nucleus and instruct the nucleus to proliferate and grow, divide, and all that. So great, that's like you know we found a cure for cancer. Herceptin will kill all the breast cancer cells, but no. Um, unfortunately, there are other downstream pathways. So you have this pathway called PI3K AKT pathway as well, which is another. Um, growth pathway in cancer. And so kahit, kahit you, in, kahit you, kahit, um, you, you, you dampen this response, um, this will be overactivated. Um, and so that leads to resistance as well. And then um, breast cancer cells, it's not just the HER2 receptor. Um, they also have other receptors. Um, they have what we call the estrogen receptor. Uh, and that also feeds into the AKT pathway. And so again, this will, even inhibit moto, you also have this receptor that you have to target because this will also promote cell proliferation and growth. So that's one aspect. So you have, you have the alternative growth pathway. You have other receptors present in the cell as well. Uh, and then you also have you know, the integrin receptors we spoke about earlier. Um, the one that like helps you move around with the, the feet and the migratory phenotype of the cells. And so these integrin receptors feed into another pathway. Um, they signal uh, to a protein called FAC, my favorite protein during my PhD. Um, and then FAC um, then feeds into AKT again. AKT will then cause the cell proliferation growth and all that. So, you know, Kahit meron isang drug dito, there's other, it's so complex. The cancer cell is, 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 is very clever, uh, matigas ang ulo. Um, so they will you know, find ways to evade, to escape the, this drug um, here. And so ideally, we need to combine therapies. And so what you can do is combine drugs that target here, PI3 kinase, drugs that target AKT, um, combine Herceptin with um, an estrogen receptor. And this is being done in the clinic combining Herceptin with um, Tamoxifen um, that targets um, the estrogen receptor. Uh, and then you can target, again, other proteins called FAC. So this is what I was studying during my PhD, um, this drug from Pfizer. So combining Herceptin with, with FAC. Um, so, you know, this is the, the way forward. You're not just using one drug. You're, you're doing a combination of drugs. But again, the downside of that is um, side effects. So, you know, if you have to be really optimize and carefully combine the drugs, um, and this is why you have to do the clinical trials because you can't just combine it. A doctor can't just say, oh, I thought of something. Um, I'll combine this. But no, it has to go to the clinical trial process because the toxicity of combining multiple drugs for a patient, um, yeah, it's, it can kill as well. And so this is an example of um, how we tackle or how the research that you know, we do in addressing drug resistance. So I I was talking about my favorite protein called FAP and HER2. And this is um, just showing you, you know, what we can do um, in the lab um, just to show that um, combining combination regimens 
um, is, is the way forward. Um, so this is the, um, an, an MTS assay. So you remember earlier, young cell proliferation assay. So I'm using here the MTS assay. Um, and here are, again, MBA361. These are breast cancer cells that have the HER2 uh, in their surface. And so here in black is the Herceptin alone, Herceptin lang, and we treat them, we treat cells with increasing doses of the drug from zero, the control, to 10 micromolar Herceptin alone. What happens if you combine it with a FAC inhibitor? Uh, so you're combining this with this inhibitor is you actually enhance the response of Herceptin. So here, from, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here. So this just shows that, you know, FAC, is actually um, a mechanism of resistance to Herceptin because when you combine or if you inhibit both of them, you actually um, kill more cells. And so that's just one way um, of, of studying um, drug resistance. And then another um, um, resistance mechanism is, as I said, the mutation or altered expression of um, a drug target. And so going back here again, complicated, but I'll simplify it. Uh, this is the tumor, uh, the cancer cell. Um, so now we move from breast to, to, this is a lung cancer cell, for example. And so in a lung cancer cell, they often express not the HER2, but the EGFR receptor. So again, same thing, um, antenna receives messages from, from the extracellular the environment um, to signal the cells to, to grow, the, the cancer cells to grow. Um, so there is a drug, um, it's called erlotinib um, from Roche. Um, so this, is, this will inhibit, very similar to the Herceptin, inhibits um, a certain part of the EGFR receptor. And great, like very effective. This was approved early 90s, I think, or maybe late 90s, um, the, the erlotinib. Um, but what happens if, when um, they become resistant? So um, the most common resistance mut mutation, um, resistance mechanism is when they have a mutation. So they acquire this, what we call this T790M mutation in the receptor. And what does that mutation do? Um, they will actually alter the shape of the protein um, in a way na hindi na makakabind yung erlotinib effectively sa receptor. So basically the drug will no longer work because you have this mutation. So that's one resistance um, mechanism. And so EGFR here, this um, schematic on the right, is a receptor that is very prone to mutations. Um, so here they have this tyrosine kinase domain that is like the hotspot um, for mutations. Um, so, you know, I was just talking about one, the T790M, but there are other mutations um, involved in, 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 in drug resistance. And so now I think in the last 10 years alone, um, research has led to the development of you know, second gen uh, and third gen um, drugs. Um, so one of them is, is osimertinib that specifically targets that mutation. Um, but now I, I can see in, 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 the, in, in research that you know, there's not just this, um, there's definitely more mutations. So EGFR receptor is, is yeah, it's so makulit, and they you know matigas ang ulo, and they will just keep acquiring mutations and resistance. So definitely more research needs to be done um, with EGFR and and lung cancer as well, um, because they just evade and they just continue to mutate and be resistant um, and to cancer. So I think ah, really cool. In conclusion, so I hope I've given you, I hope I wasn't too fast, but you can ask me questions because I think I went quite fast. Um, in conclusion, um, my cancer research career was daunting. It's a daunting task for scientists, but it's also very, very rewarding. And as we mentioned at the start, it's not a single disease. It is over 200 diseases, all characterized by those hallmarks um, that was defined by Robert Weinberg and um, Douglas Hanahan in 2000. Um, and so, you know, cancer research, I, I was focused on molecular kind of biology, a molecular pharmacology of, of cancer kind of, you know, 
um, using the drugs, understanding drugs and finding the mechanisms of drugs, but there's different areas um, of, of research that you can pursue um, in cancer. So you have the drug discovery phase, um, you have genetics as well. So if you can imagine, you know, yung, yung, yung mga mutations, um, to, to study these mutations in a large population of patients is another field, um, um, genomics of, of, of cancer. So that's a big field. Uh, medicinal chemistry, I mean, this is very important because as a biologist, we just understand the mechanisms, but we need the chemists to actually like formulate the drug. Like, I, I don't know how to synthesize a molecule or, or things like that. Like, I, I know the biology, but I don't know how to create um, a drug. Um, so we, you know, you need the medicinal chemists. Um, again, as I said, resistance mechanism is another big field in cancer research, because as you know, breast cancer, lung cancer, any type of cancer will develop um, a mechanism of a resistance. Um, another gap, um, as we've touched upon, is, is the 3D modeling. Um, so again, this is a huge area in cancer research. I just touched upon like two methods that we've been trying to optimize in the lab, but there's other kind of things as well. Um, so yeah, moving away from the 2D, the flat Petri dish type of culture, which, you know, it's very plastic. It doesn't fully represent the tumor in the body, more towards 3D that will hopefully um, uh, reduce the failure rate of, of, of the clinical trials um, in the future. And this is a very new area, cancer evolution, um, very uh, kind of genomics, lots of um, more, more away from a wet lab, but more kind of lots of computer data analysis kind of work. So again, this is, this is very kind of summarized version, but there's other areas as well for, for cancer research. Um, and then as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, it's very unsurprising that one single group will develop a drug and then you know, make it to the clinic because it's, it's cancer research is collaborative. Um, you, you, you have to collaborate with other research groups who have different expertise. I'm not a chemist, I'm just a biologist. Um, I'm not a physicist, so there's lots of like, physics people also do a lot of the 3D modeling work. Um, kind of um, algorithms um, to, to model um, cancer cells. You know, we had to collaborate with phys physics people as well. Um, what else? But yeah, so it's not just one research group, but it's a collaboration. You also have to collaborate not just with other academics, but also with pharmaceutical companies. So pharmaceutical companies um, will fund, often fund um, the development of the drug and they have the money to bring your idea um, your little molecule that you've discovered into clinic. Because as, as I mentioned earlier, to take a drug from the, the, the discovery stage to the clinic, it takes billions and billions of dollars. So again, you cannot just do it alone. It needs to be collaborative. Um, but progress is being made. Uh, this is a graph showing here the number of drugs approved in the last five years. So I think six, yeah, total of 64 Oncology, uh, so cancer drugs have launched globally in the past five years. So bringing a 20 year total of 161. So 161 drugs now are available for cancer. And this is because of all the research, all the preclinical scientists working, um, collaborating with different groups. And um, this is up by 75% actually since 2019. So this just highlights the breadth and, and you know, what research can do um, in cancer. Um, to, to bring drugs to, to the market. And I think, oh, and then here's a slide I did. Um, different kind of career opportunities for biology and cancer research. So again, you know, you, you'll be sitting in, in your, your kind of room and thinking, you know, what am I gonna do cancer? I wanna do cancer research, but what else can I do? I do a degree and things like that, but you know, there's different options and it's not just the straightforward, um, lab route as well. So the most obvious is obviously to, to pursue a medical degree if you wanna be an oncologist or you can be a radiologist um, or you can pursue a science degree, a research scientist. You can work in an academic lab, which I did. Um, I work in a research institute, which I did as well. I haven't done hospital um, work, uh, good try. Um, you can also be a research scientist for a pharma company. So big pharma, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Roche, as an example earlier, who discovered 
who developed Herceptin for, for breast cancer. So you can work at these companies as well as, as a biologist, as a chemist, um, different options there. Um, medical writing is also another common, common path for, 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 for graduates. Um, so this is, you know, when you write for kind of medical education books, um, for, 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 for doctors, um, for nurses, kind of um, educational events, educational pamphlets and things like that. Um, consulting is, is where I moved into um, from, from being a research scientist into in a lab, I moved into pharma consulting. So what we do is basically advise pharma companies, big pharma companies, small pharma companies on what they will do with their drugs and which kind of tumor uh, will they target? Like, you know, so I'm working with a company now that they have this one drug and they don't know where to go. Lung cancer, bar, breast cancer, bar, like, and so we have to kind of give them um, justification on why they should go to breast or why shouldn't they go to breast or why they should pursue this drug in lung cancer, things like that. Um, so yeah, that's consulting. Um, regulatory affairs is also very new, but this is basically involved. Uh, so let's say you have a drug in phase three, uh, but you now you're in the position to, to file uh, with the FDA or another regulatory agency for approval. And so you're involved in the kind of collating all the clinical data, collating all the kind of preclinical, the experiments as well, putting all that package together so that you can submit um, this massive document to the FDA. Um, and so they will assess it and hopefully the drug gets approved. Um, and then, or you can be a, you know, a data scientist as well as in, so this is more kind of, as I mentioned earlier, you know, cancer evolution, big data, genomics. I don't understand it at all, um, but we work closely with them as well um, for, 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 for big um, um, genomics study as well. So I think that is it. Hopefully, I, I, I used up an hour. Maybe yeah. not. Oh, the, actually, perfect timing, Glory. Thank you so much. And like, by the way, um, uh, maraming maraming salamat. Uh, I learned a lot and I know for sure that our audience members have also learned a lot from this study. So uh, students no, and teachers like lalong lalo na sa high school tsaka sa college level sa Philippines. So uh, we have Glory, you know, like she's, uh, you know, like a Filipina who's making significant contributions in the area of cancer research. So kung nakita nyo po from fundamentals, uh, like from, 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 from a science background and dam through her academic journey and then now that she's working for um, a consulting uh, company. And so, um, maraming maraming salamat, Glory, first for what you do and for generously sharing, you know, all these information with uh, our students and teachers in the Philippines. But before tayo pumunta sa Q&A, by the way, sobrang um, engaged ang ating mga estudyante at mga guro. We have more than 20 questions, actually. Sobrang triggered sila. <laughs> and I think I, more, more will actually actually be um, sent in. So we'll give um, our speaker, we'll, we'll give Glory uh, uh, five minutes no, to rest her voice. Okay. Kasi it's, so I get a toilet very... break. <laughs> yeah, it's very early in the morning and sabi ko, oh, naku, lumalabas, na, lumalabas yung British accent niya. <laughs> I know. Uh, sorry. So dulo, I, I really sorry. Eh. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's actually good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, guys, uh, we were talking earlier and um, uh, pinapag-usap, uh, tinatanong kami ni Glory, paano ba yung uh, tone para maging most relatable yung delivery niya? So she tried her best to also speak in Tagalog. <laughs> and to, I think there was there was an effort for her to also um, switch her accent into a more um, Filipino type of accent. So ganyan po, ganyan po talaga yung dedication ni Glory. But anyways, so we're gonna give her a few minutes of, of break and then we'll actually go over uh, now some some videos and then I will be plugging some of our upcoming events then. And then after that, we'll okay. proceed to the cleaning. All right. Bye-bye. I'll be back. Yep. Welcome to Fellow Sci Hub Research University, your ultimate guide on your next research project. We will lay down the best practices in research ideation, literature review, experimental design, and data analysis to guide you as you carry out your research project. Learn from the PhilSciHub team 
of research scientists, and some invited subject matter experts. Phil Hub Research University will be your personal coach through every stage of your research project from ideation to final assessment. And the best part, it's absolutely free. Visit us at philsci-hub.com and be part of this learning journey. Let's learn and succeed together here at Philsci-Hub Research University. So actually, mag-share naman ako ng um, a couple of slides, uh, Dr. Janice. Hindi ako sanis, Dr. Janice. Uh, Jaja ang nasasabi ko. <laughs> um, so, um, um, Janice, ano, 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 yung mga, ano, yung, ano yung medyo mga tumatak sa'yo na learnings from today's session, if I, if I may ask? Dami. <laughs> Oo, oh, grabe, no? Diba, yun nga yung sabi ko sa'yo, makulit talaga ang mga cancer cells. <laughs> Oo, oh, ayan. Teka, um. And we're also joined by JP Onya. Let me just uh, uh, let him in. Um, JP, magparamdam ka. <laughs> Ayan. So we're joined um, by JP Onya, the, the head of the uh, Research University. Um, he's actually based in Turku, uh, Turku Finland. So, Glory. Uh, actually, JP, really? uh, Glory. Uh, yeah. He's based in I was in Turku. Yeah. For a year. My Erasmus year. Oh, uh, oh, JP is also an Erasmus uh, scholar. Hey, yeah. Cool. And oh, by the way, by the way, yeah, John Marty Mateo, um, uh, one of the you know one of the uh, 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 leaders of of uh, Filipino. Siempre yun announce ko proud tayo sa kasama natin. Oh. He just um uh he was just he just got he just received like a very good news that he's getting a, an an Erasmus scholarship. So he's can be studying in Poland. So Sir Martin nyo po ay mangibang bayan na very very soon. So let's all wish yeah. him luck. Ayan. Pero allow me to share my screen first because uh, I would just like to share with everyone na uh, um this like so our our session with Glory on Wait cancer uh, <laughs> on cancer uh, drug development is the third of uh you know like the four uh, episodes that we have prepared for you in. 
uh, in, like you know, like in the month of April, April, which is our biology month. So next week, po, right around the same time, 10 in the morning in the Philippines, we will be uh, having our last, um, and essentially our final installment featuring Professor uh, Euphrosina Atabay from uh, the Philippine Car. be uh, talking about transformation of the Philippine Carabao uh, from a beast of burden to a beast of fortune. So, yeah, diba? it's very exciting. So, kung nakita niyo yung, yung hierarchy ng ano, ng ano, no, ng, ng, ng topics natin from bacteria and then and then aquatic uh, fungi, uh, we moved on to cancer cells naman and then um, uh, drug development and then punta naman tayo dun sa organism level. No? Kalabaw naman yung uh, ano, kalabaw naman yung pag-uusapan natin next week. Ayan. So, uh, we we hope to actually see you there. And then tomorrow, the, tomorrow will, tomorrow at 10 in the morning in the Philippines will be the premiere episode of a new program that we are launching sa, uh, through Philsci Hub, which we call this Philsci Hub's Career Guidance Series. So essentially, we're, we are inviting uh, a number of uh, notable Filipino uh, STEM professionals, you know, like coming from different fields. And for our first episode, it's titled STEM, Roots and Branches. So uh, we would... share with you strategies on how you, you'd be able to grow your STEM training or your STEM skills in various career areas. And wag po kayong magugulat, hindi po mga K-drama actors po yan, mga na, napakagwapo na ating mga guests bukas. Ano. So we have Jeffrey Malolis and Kevin Season. Um, so these are uh, two Filipino STEM professionals who, who, uh, you know, who are developing themselves in the Philippines and um, who are making an impact in the Philippines. So sila naman yung mga counterparts namin na sa Pilipinas nag-train and sa Pilipinas din nagpa-practice at nag-lead. And just to give you an idea sa mga estudyante ngayon, um, some of you might actually be wondering, kailangan ko ba mag-PhD? Kailangan ko ba mag-master's for me to be able to you know, um, uh, make an impact sa, 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 sa iba't ibang areas ng STEM? So this is the talk that you... Uh, Uh, you would actually uh, like to hear. So tomorrow at 10 in the morning, they will be sharing about how they leverage their biochemistry and marine science uh, undergrad <clears throat> degrees into a bunch of different areas. So they're, uh, you know, they're, active, uh, they're active in research. Uh, they, they are also involved in tech transfers and also like startups. So they're part of... Uh, They're country directors of this organization called Leave a Nest that helps small companies and even high school and college level researchers na makahanap ng pondo for research. So sa mga high school students, if you're interested in learning about Leave a Nest and yung opportunity for, for high school research funding, uh, check it out tomorrow. So ito, silang dalawa rin, they're involved in the areas of science communication, uh, STEMpreneurship, so entrepreneurship, but you know, like uh, like in, like in sa, sa field naman ng STEM, consultancy, just like glory, uh, leadership, as well as, um, so, uh, one of them is also like a professor. So ang dami nilang hats na, uh, kumbaga, sinusuot. So uh, don't um, uh, miss out on that. And and then so uh, the uh, registration uh, details nasa website namin and then also nasa Facebook. So we hope to see you tomorrow um, at the same time, yeah? 10 in the morning. All right. So, Gloria, handa ka na ba? <laughs> We have, we have, we have, yeah, we have, we have 20 questions. So, uh, if a fast talk ba natin to? Hindi, joke lang. <laughs> Why so, based? Yeah, siguro the four of us will, ano, uh, si JP, J- uh, si uh, Jaja, and then si uh, Dr. Connie, uh, we will, uh, ibabato namin yung questions na to. So, and, and, and I will start. So, this came from YouTube. So, from Manolita White. So, her question was, Um, why is basic cancer research very important? And why uh, does it need to be integrated with more applied cancer research and um, with cancer care? So, it's a loaded yung question. Niya, yeah, no? yeah, no. yeah. I, I, I think, so basic cancer research is very important because that's where eventually your end product is the drug. But how it gets to the drug, you need the basic cancer research. So let's say, let's talk about yung Herceptin, di ba? Um, how it became to receptin. Someone needed to discover the, the HER2 receptor. Someone needed to link the, the, the overexpression of HER2 receptor uh, in breast cancer. And so how do you do that basic cancer research? You, you have to start with the cells. Uh, you know, the cell lines that I was talking about, you have to start there. 
um, establish the proof of concept na involved ba yung her two na yon. Uh, and then you kind of slowly, you know, do the research in more complex model systems, in 3D, in mouse, and then you be, eventually become uh, go into the clinical trials. So I think it's the fundamentals of, 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 of drug discovery, to, to, drug discovery to, to start with the basics um, first. So, so the proof of concept needs to be in the basic kind of cancer research type. All right. All right. So uh, next question naman tayo, Janice. So from Ryan, when is, a tumor? Wong, when is the tumor cancerous and is this the same as malignant tumor? So those terms are all interchangeable. So a tumor okay. is a cell that has become malignant. Um, cancer, tumor, malignant cells, they're all interchangeable um, terms. And so when a cell becomes malignant, um, as we mentioned earlier, they have to acquire those kind of characteristics that was defined, yung hallmarks ng cancer. They need to, to proliferate like crazy. They need to invade. They need to resist um, cell death. So these kind of hallmarks, they need to acquire for them to become malignant or become a tumor. So they're all interchangeable. Right. Spelling lang sa UK is T-U-M-O-U-R. <laughs> oh yeah, the British system, <laughs> just like Canada, you know, and then extra letters. Um, yeah, the, the, the Commonwealth system. All right, oh, that, that's so, a hard question. Oh yeah, doctor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, doctor, doctor Gibas, would you like to um uh throw okay. this question at Lori? <laughs> this is again from uh, Manolita White. What is the most important hallmark of cancer? Wow, that's tough. Um, I think. I can't say which one is the most important, but I think I can say which one is, as I mentioned already, the one that causes the, you know, the most mortality is metastasis. So when a tumor sits in an, you know, in a site nicely encapsulated, um, you can take that off with surgery. You take that off, you're cured. But then when that tumor starts to invade and access your blood system, Hindi mo na yon. It's all over around your body. It's in the blood system. It can go to your brain, your kidneys, and everything. So I think that causes the most deaths in patients. So I think that is the most important hallmarks of cancer. All right. Oh, diba? Ang daming burning questions, Glory. Okay, <laughs> next one. Yeah. JP. Bukas na tayo uwi nito. What is the most Yeah. Uh, JP, I think you're on mute. He's unmuted, pero walang sound. Uh, baka ano. Uh, sige, ako muna magbato. So this is from Ryan Huang as well. So ang dami niya ding tanong. What is the most common mode of uh, action of anti-cancer drugs? Most common mode of action? It depends eh, because as I said, you have chemotherapy. Yeah. So chemotherapy is, I say, is, is still very widely used in the clinic. You often combine it with your targeted therapy. You combine it with immunotherapy. But chemotherapy, when we in the lab or like you discover compounds or like sometimes you what was it they have like you know, curcumin or something from like the Indian curries like oh curcumin kills cancer uh, mm-hmm. or things like that. Um, so the mechanisms the most common I think is yung, yung, yung chemotherapy. So what they do is a compound. So this is the DNA and how you explain. I don't, know, I don't have a the double helix. This is the double helix. This is the double helix. So a chemotherapy will basically insert itself in the different in grooves on DNA. Yung ganun ng DNA. Oh my God, can't even say it. Uh, it inserts itself in the grooves in the DNA. So basically, it creates the DNA. It's unable to divide. Um, so I think you know that's that's uh, that's one of the mechanisms of chemotherapy, and because it's still widely used, I think that's it's a very common mechanism. So is that inter intercalation? You're right. I'm going to use intercalation. I didn't want that's, to say intercalation. That, that's from my bi- bi- Biochem 161 from UP it's about 20 years ago. <laughs> intercalates in the DNA. Yeah. Thing. Sorry po, nerd lang. <laughs> <laughs> Naalala ko lang yung pa-exam ni Ma'am Laksamana. Anyways. Yes. Intercalation. Pro chemist ang nandito. JP! <laughs> I will have. Okay, lang, okay, lang yan, no, no, it's okay. So, um, okay, it's okay. Janice. Yeah, 
Ayan, from Daniel Reyes. Good morning, Paul. I've recently read an article where a study found that fighting mutant cancer cells is to create more mutations, Paul. Can I ask what your thoughts are, Paul, regarding to that? Exactly and what I... Of, and another question is, um, oh, ito naman is what to expect or tips in taking a chemistry major in college. Uh-oh. Hirap yun. Na-inspire mo madam. Siguro, siguro, oh, siguro, siguro, yung tutulungan ka na lang ng mga chemists sa pagsagot ng pangalawang oh, question. Sige, oh, oh. Pangalawa. Or, or yung field niya mismo. Kasi I think madami ka talagang na-trigger. So, yeah. Na-trigger. <laughs> okay, let's answer oh, the first story. question first. Where study found the be- That's exactly what I I mentioned about yung lung cancer. Um, the drug erlotinib. Um, so when you inhibit Um, the, the, the the EGFR receptor, um, because of that pressure, the cancer wants to mutate. It wants to survive. It has all these mechanisms built in into its system that I want to mutate. I want to do that. So that's what happens um, when you when you have this pressure of a drug. The, the the cell wants to mutate and create more mutations, but this is why you need to have the you know multi armor targeting of of the the tumor and that's where research needs needs to happen because as as yeah it's a common phenomenon uh, when you when you treat cells we will mutate and this is still an unmet need and cancer uh, when they acquire mutations when you treat them but you have to treat them you can't just leave them because you're scared of gaining mutations you have to treat the patients you have to aim for cure but you, you run the risk of gaining your mutations so then you need to develop more drugs to target those more mutations that you anticipate as a second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line therapy um, in cancer. It's a, it's a hard task. May, may tanong ako, Glory, um, it, ano, connected dito sa mutation. Kunyari, kung nag-mutate na yung receptors na nasa mm. surface, surface ng cell, mm. when, di syempre nahihirapan na yung small molecule mo na drug, di ba, para mag-bind doon sa receptor. Do, yeah. you also, do you also develop, like meron bang mga um, cancer, anti-cancer therapy na um nagde neutralize instead ng ligands. Yes. Yeah. Instead. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kasi ang hirap <laughs> paano pag gagalawin yung true. mutation, 'di ba? Mahirap siya. So, that's true. bakit hindi yung ligands yung e? That, uh, that's 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 true because there yeah, there, there are all decoy receptors. So, you're right, we can target the ligands um so they don't signal into the cancer, but then if you think about it, the ligands are also needed for other healthy types of cells. Not just the cancer cell. So the the the, the growth factor, let's say you know, heregulin, um, the one that activates the HER2 receptor. Yes, they breast cancer cells need that growth factor receptor. But also heregulin is very important for your heart, for your cardiac function. So if you inhibit um, that heregulin, you'll have cardiac malfunction. And one of the side effects, actually, if receptin is 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 cardiac malfunction because of the HER2 and you're inhibiting the HER2. So in theory, it's good. But I think practically, we're not there yet. You're up more balance. Eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because yeah. you have growth factors. It's basically oh, everywhere in yeah. healthy cells. Yeah. So so yeah, medyo ano kasi um siguro indiscriminate diba yung uh, yung 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 mechanism. So sabi nga ni Glory kanina, um it yung 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 drugs um hindi lang yung cancer cells yung tinatamaan, pati healthy cells. So Yeah. So it's finding that fine balance. You cannot yep. avoid it because yep. even targeted therapy my side effects. Yep. Um but You know, you're trying your best to just really focus on the cancer cells. Yep. I, I think it's yeah, it's the same thing as you know, like yung um, drug development, say for example for HIV, right? Merong mga chemicals that would kill HIV, but then those mm. chemicals would also kill the the person. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Ganon siya. Yeah. Iba yung sinabi nga ni Trump. Yeah. I don't know if you're ano, but for COVID, if you just drink bleach, of course it will kill the virus. Yes, but kill the person. It will kill, so, kill the person as well. Yeah. Same thing with chemo. <laughs> <laughs> so di ba kung kung gagamit ka ng synergy drugs kailangan pipiliin mo yung mga synergy niya na drugs exactly. yung least harmful then yeah yeah and so, least, least harmful yung... and and yung hindi implicated sa healthy cells yeah. very hard to find That's hard it's hard yeah so Kaya there's so many combinations 
pahirapan dyan is hahanapin mo talaga kung saan yung source ng cancer, I guess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what I think what's very kind of trendy now, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've heard the term CRISPR. Yes, um, I was going to so, ask that. <laughs> yeah, so CRISPR is a way to genetically modify or say the mutations. It's still very new. I don't think there's anything approved in a cancer tumor yet, but CRISPR is a way that you can basically, you can essentially cut the mutation out. Uh, and so, you know, you, you render the cells more sensitive to the drug. So, so it's still in very preclinical stage, but it's, it's, it's a very promising technology. I'm sure you've heard about it. It's like the, it won the Nobel prize. I think it's my very favorite different. technology. Yeah. So it's, it's, you can cut the, the mutation out and then kind of completely be, make it sensitive to the drug again, preclinical. But again, I, as you can imagine, it takes billions and billions of pounds to get that kind of technology into a cancer patient. And oy grabe no. Ang 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 yeah. aking um, ang aking layman's analogy ng cancer drug development ay parang pag naghahanap ka ng love life, ang yeah. ang pipiliin mo yung tatanggalin yung sakit pero hindi ka sasaktan. Oh, kailangan ganyan na kasi mga students yung kausap natin, yung magagaling sila diyan ngayon, eh. joke lang. Anyway, so to answer yung second question, yung chemistry, oh, ikaw na yung okay. chemistry. Siguro yung chemistry pwedeng pwedeng sumagot yung uh, tatlo kasi yung chemist dito si JP tsaka si Jaja and ako perhaps I could start um, uh, it, I think chemistry is also like a very good place to start when it comes kung, kung interested kayo sa cancer research sinabi nga ni Glory um, sh- sh- nag-aaral sila ng cells but then um, kailangan meron ding mga um, uh, taong involved who would make the molecules no? kasi at the end of the day you have to synthesize the drug you know especially if it's you know like um uh, a, spe- uh, a a small molecule so ako yung experience ko babalik lang ako dun sa college days ko sa UP yung PhD thesis ko was um you know studying phytochemicals so essentially natural products research so meron kaming mga ine-extract na chemicals from plants uh, na merong mga uh, kumbaga um uh specific properties. And yung inaral ko, for example, nung ako'y nasa college under the tutelage of Professor uh, Evelyn Rodriguez, who was one of the leaders in the countries, in the, in the Philippines when it comes to natural products research, um, we extracted plant sterols as potential um, anti-hypocholesterolemia um, um, agents as well as um, uh, uh, Angioge- anti-angiogenesis. Or, uh, yeah. So, so di ba, medyo may relevancy din yun sa cancer, di ba? Yung, yung ability ng um, chemical na yun um, to um, uh, inhibit or promote yung uh, formation ng blood vessels. So, doon, na-trigger din naman ako na parang, okay, parang gusto ko tong chemical biology aralin. So, before, uh, so, nag actually nag-apply ako sa Purdue University and natanggap ako and I almost uh, yeah went to pursued yung medicinal chemistry but then before leaving the country I went to a shell um you know the, to the energy sector and that changed the course of my life but um bakit ko ba binanggit yung story ako uh, yung research ko in my undergrad years it actually piqued my interest into um um you know essentially the, the farm far, pharmaceutical area medyo kumpaka nag-iba lang ako ng direction pero you can experience that as early as at the college level ayan si si Dr. Jack Janice naman, siya talagang ano, pang ano, pang <laughs> uh, medyo related dito yung area niya. Janice. Ayun, ako naman, um, kasi ngayon ay nasa liver biology kami, basically studying um, effects of alcohol sa liver, ganyan. Um, ako naman, I think kung, in, so, I, I think alam na nitong batang to na in, kind of interested siya sa chemistry. Kung, kung ako sa, ano, nasa lagay niya, tapos gusto kong mapunta sa mga medyo cancer kind of um, molecular biology siguro sa uh, special um, na sangay ng chemistry is biochemistry yeah. na pinakamalapit dito kasi parang ako noon para yung background ko is like very general chemistry di ba tayo lahat inaral natin pchem biochem mm-hmm. lahat organic chem So I think parang kung alam mo na na ito yung magiging uh, gusto mong maging field I think pinakamalapit na area ng chemistry ay biochemistry. Yun makakatulong talaga siya. Yan. Kuya, Kuya JP. Hello. 
Pinasa. Narinig niyo na ba ako? Narinig ka na namin. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, dun sa question ni, ni Daniel, parang, um, yun nga, uh, yung car- career sa chemistry opens up a lot of possibilities. So, uh, congratulations for um, choosing uh, a chemistry career. And uh, while you're at it, um, just take in as much as possible. Yep. Um, from, kasi maraming ang fields yung chemistry. Uh, sabi ni Janice. Pero uh, while you're you're covering the fundamentals, try to uh, try to see which one um, relates to you the best, so that um, kakapili ka na nung career na um, tatahakin mo uh, after graduation, no? And that's a tough job, kasi uh, pwedeng uh, gusto mo yung analytical chemistry, pero parang inclinated ka rin sa uh, biochemistry, pero Uh, they're all working together. So while while you're covering the fundamentals, um, just see which one um, uh, resonates you, re- resonates with you the, the most. You know? And uh, learn as much as uh, possible about that field. And uh, kahit kasi parang ang pinaka direction na is uh, towards uh, parang yung mga molecular ah, mga models. You know? yep. So try to Data learn driven, um, computational chemistry as possible kasi parang yun yung pinaka important uh, pinaka trendy or uh, pinaka in demand right now. Yep. Ayan, oh di ba? Meron kayong panel na <laughs> sumasagot. All right. Next question. Um JP would you like to throw this at Glory? Yeah. Okay, from Carl Raymond Consuegra. How different po is MTS assay from MTT assay? I think they're, they're essentially the same. Um, I think MTS, the substrate is, it's, it's different, but the, 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 the principle is the same. So the, the MTS, I think, I don't know exactly the full name of it, but the substrate is different. But the, 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 as I said, the, 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 the principle is the same. The, the, the live cells will need to reduce the substrate in order to release that formazan um, product na color blue or purple ba yun. But yeah, there are, the, there are different substrates but the, the process is the same. Grabe yung questions ng audience natin. No? Lalim no? My God, I have to go back. <laughs> uh, all right, Janice. Ayan, from... Oh, madami siyang question na. Eh. Oh, actually, <laughs> dapat mangolekta na tayo ng consultation fee. Oh, <laughs> Ayan, from Ryan again, can you do a proliferative assays on healthy cells or must it be on cancer cell lines for no, cancer definitely. studies? No, they're exact. Yes, you should because if you, if, you, if you, you have a drug and you want to make sure na they only affect cancer cells and not healthy cells, as we mentioned, we want the drug to be targeted. You have to test them both in a cancer cell line and a healthy cell. Pag namatay yung healthy cell, then you know, It's, then you shouldn't pursue that drug. So okay. yes, it's essential that you have to test your cells uh, in both cancers okay. and, and healthy cells. Okay. 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 Is, is, is cytotoxicity different from proliferative assay? <laughs> so the, it, it gives you the same sort of answer, yeah. but it detects different things. So, so proliferative assay is, let's say, how fast the cells grow Whereas a cytotoxicity assay is how much do cells die. So, but you still get the same answer to your question. Ito bang drug na to, nakakamatay ba to ng breast cancer cell? You can do both assays and hopefully they will give you the same results. But they are, they are answering, um, they are kind of answering different processes, but essentially the same um, um, end goal. All right. Dr. Giba, Giba, this 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 person is very familiar to us. So it's a question from I know this um, our intern Hi, from Joshua Central Ison. Luzon State University, <laughs> Joshua Ison. And by the way, he unloaded dalawa pong pages ang kanyang question. So mama, uh, okay. Dr. Giba. <laughs> Good morning po from Joshua Ison. I am an undergrad student working on secondary metabolites as um Well done. Potential. Yeah. As potential mm. anti-cancer agent. In terms of a compound 
bioavailability, what do, you, what do experts consider to say these compounds are a great agent against cancer cell lines? I'm trying to understand the question. Okay. <laughs> so in terms of compounds, bioavailability, bioavailability for me means how you're able to actually take it into the body. Yep. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. What do these consider? Okay. Okay. I'll try and answer it. Um, so when you're developing a cancer drug, you're testing it in a cancer cell and great. It kills the cell. Um, but then when you, this is why it's essential to do the clinical trials um, because you don't know how these drugs are metabolized in the mm -hmm. human body. So when a drug enters the blood system, it needs to be absorbed um, on your bloodstream. It needs to be metabolized. Um, and then it needs to be excreted as well. You don't want the drug na mana forever na lang sa katawan mo. And so these are, otherwise you'll just die. So I think these are the things that you need to consider. Um, I hope I'm answering the question. So yeah, how you how the drug um, is, is vi viable, it can easily be absorbed in the bloodstream. And also that it needs to get to the tumor. So because some, some drugs, maybe they have like an affinity or like they really want to go to the heart or the brain or things like that. And that's when you get the side effects. So again, their affinity for organs, you need to consider um, how they're metabolized by the liver and how they need to be excreted because you don't want the drugs to live within you forever. Yeah. I hope. So, yeah. I, 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 I liked all of the, uh, you know, like the points that you mentioned. So it, it, it all the more highlights the fact that cancer research is, is an interdisciplinary research. Because, you know, from a chemistry perspective, we might be able to, do, you know, um, synthesize or design compounds, no? But you yeah. said, mo organ affinity, mahakarating bayan dun sa dapat mapuntahan. And yeah. so it requires requires you know like uh, uh collaborative work among uh, different fields no so uh, this this is actually very nice guys and and and, and ito ngayon ko lang to naririnig no so uh, super exciting these are very good questions guys like, yeah these are oh, very you know in depth I, yeah, i follow it, up glory yeah. so kung kung naggagamit ka ng anti cancer drug naggag gumagawa ba ng uh, levels as a assay yung mga doctors Level. Yung levels ng anti-cancer drugs sa, sa patient. Hitting natin nila yung levels. Kung toxic na ba yung levels niya. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. So they have um, different blood works. Um, oh, okay. you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have, I'm sure the liver biologist here will answer, you know, the AST, ALT levels yeah. oh, of the liver. Okay. So that is indicative of how, how, how um, you're metabolizing the drug and things like that. But yeah, so they do. AST, ALT, I yeah, yeah. increased. Ibig sabihin, exactly. Yeah. I'm not a liver biologist, but I, definitely oh, the liver enzyme. Kung nangasin ELT and AST, medyo nakakasama na siya sa liver. Yeah. So there are things like that that doctors track. So the blood, usually when you treat a cancer patient, let's say the first week um, for, for chemotherapy, they're usually um, inpatient. Um, uh -huh. So you, you kind of monitor them for a week, so especially the breast cancer patients. Um, as was, I mentioned with the Herceptin, it affects the heart. So sometimes they stay inpatient, monitor the heart, you know, injection, fraction of heart. So you know, have to, the doctors do monitor. Okay. So when do you get blood samples? So trough or? Uh, for when you treat? Mm. I, I, I don't know actually how, how often doctors take, um, but I guess when you take it, I mean, maybe you'll take it during uh, half-life and drugs. That's when you probably take the blood sample. I'm not uh -huh. so sure. I should, yeah, I'll, I should know that, but okay. I'm not a clinician. <laughs> All right. So, follow-up question naman ni Joshua. Ito no medyo career guidance, no, Glory? I think you inspired him. So, another question that... You know, that I think na, you are friends <laughs> in Facebook. Oh, yeah! He added yeah, me. Yeah, you remember I, him? Yes, I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, ang tanong po niya is, uh, ngayon po, ako nagkakaroon ng interest um, in cancer research. So, but he doesn't have a clear vision on uh, how to pursue it. Um, do you have any tips on where and how I should start uh, after college? After? Yeah, he's actually Wait. graduating. Um, oh. So, <laughs> okay. super good. timely question. So, I think when I finished or I was kind of looking on what I will do after I graduate I really wanted to do a PhD and as I said earlier I wanted to really 
work on that protein fact. I was obsessed with it. Um, so I started reading the papers, um, uh, you know, kind of about fact and where are the labs that study um, the, the protein fact. Um, and how I actually found my PhD was I actually emailed um, um, the, the, the group leader. Um, I told him about my experience, um, why I was interested in it, um, my skills and things like that. I sent him my, my CV resume. Um, uh, and that's how I found it. So I think what you should do is, you know, find the areas of cancer research that you're interested. As I mentioned, Andame, you can look at drug resistance, you can look at mm-hmm. chemistry, drug discovery, um, you can do genetics and that's like kind of find, look for those areas that you, you re- that really draw you in uh, and just reach out to those, those, those group leaders, you, you researchers and I guarantee you, they 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 either will reply saying, "I'm sorry, we cannot, we have no funding," or, "Hey, I have a funding now, or maybe I have some position in the next year or so. I'll I'll reach out to you." So things like that. So don't be scared to reach out to these people. They're just humans. And I I I during my PhD, sometimes when I'm reading a paper and like I I have a question on like the figure and I don't understand it, I would literally just email the author and. I do get replies, not all the time, but, you know, essentially just email them um, and don't be scared. Reach out to, to the, the, the researchers that you're interested in working with. All right. Ang palagi Long-winded namin, answer. Yeah. No, but ang palagi <laughs> namin itinuturo sa Felsai Hub, kapal lang muka is key. <laughs> Ang Kapal mahiyain, na. yeah, ang mahiyain na iiwanan, walang napapala. <laughs> If you don't ask, the answer is always No. Exactly. Because diba? you, you, right. you, you're very passionate. You can show your passion. Yep. Fine. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and students have to realize that when you reach out to an established person, they appreciate it because that would mean na magkakaroon ng continuity yung field. Kasi kailangan may susunod. Diba? Kailangan may magtutuloy ng mga ginagawa nila and even improve or build on what they what you know what they have established, right? Glory. So, um kaya wag kayong mahihiya. Natutuwa yung mga experts kapag nagtanong kayo. All right. Uh Janice? Okay. Ito na naman siya. <laughs> si Ryan ulit. Padala mo rin ang bill. <laughs> Joke lang po. Joke lang po. Hindi po ko tayo nagpapabaya dito. Is there a lab test maybe rough blood to determine if you have cancer? The, I, that's one of the first things that um, doctors would do is is to do a blood test. Um, just again to look at, especially if you have a tumor. Usually, your liver enzymes are a little bit crazy. Um, maybe you have um, uh, what do you call them? We call them circulating tumor DNA, uh, which is a little bit uh, more complex. But you can take a blood and, and you can actually detect. Because um, sometimes tumor cells will shed a little bit of their protein, a little bit of DNA in the blood, and you can detect that in the blood. Um, so yes, there are there are blood tests out there, but um, I think the most kind of definitive way to to diagnose uh, or determine if you have cancer is to have um, the scan. Uh, so you have a CT scan or PET scan, um, MRI, MRI scan. So I think you know you can. The blood test will give you clues of what potentially you may have cancer, but uh, a scan will confirm and a biopsy will confirm if you have a cancer or not. All right. Okay. So, siguro we can entertain a couple more questions and we would like to apologize like doon sa mga questions na hindi natin makukover kasi magtatanghali yan na kayo sa Pilipinas. Um, ayaw oh. naman namin magutong kayo. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Givas? Yes. Oh, this is from, uh, how you say your name? Stizy Saldana. Stizy. Good morning from, good morning po. Natatabunan kasi yung aking. Oh, oh, student from. From yeah. Bataan National High School. Question. How can a cancer cell stay dormant for many years? Po? I love that. I like the word dormant. This is a really good question, Dormant. Dormant is a key term in cancer. Um, this is definitely an area that I wanted to touch upon, but I can spend again an hour talking about um, cancer cell dormancy. So one of the mechanisms how cancer cells 
stay dormant and then they will come back in years and years is our stem cells. So stem cells, so you have breast cancer stem cells. So these are really kind of non-differentiated cells mm-hmm. um, that are often resistant to, to treatment. So I was working on, on breast cancer and when you treat the tumor, it will kill the tumor, but you will have these stem cells that usually cannot be detected, detected with a scan, cannot be detected with a blood test, and they will stay in your system. And then 10, 20 years down the line, somehow maybe your immune system is weakened or you know, another trigger event um, in, in your, your body system, then the cancel will um, come back. Um, so yeah, I think one of the key mechanisms of dormancy is, is you're unable, di mo nababa tayong cancer stem cells. And there's again, another research area on, on, on cancer stem cells and how to kill those cancer stem cells. And I was working on that and very difficult again, but yeah, it's another field of research on, on how, how to kill and what mechanisms um, enable these stem cells to stay dormant. Again, I can answer this in another kind of session, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. That's, that's, a very, that's a very good question. Ay, It's baka, a very good question. Teka, na, na, ano lang tayo? Hindi, I don't know what happened, pero... Oo oh, nga. No. <laughs> um, uh, okay, uh, next uh, question. Uh, JP? Uh, from John Kurt Venegas. Good morning. I'm from Bata National High School. Our breast self-examination and testicular self-examination, good ways to detect early stage of breast and testicular cancer. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, I, I mean, I'm sure, you know, doctors would advise you to kind of every month to test yourself, feel yourself if any, any kind of symptom. So I don't know about much about testicular for at least for breast, you know, you can detect the shape of the nipple, any kind of secretions, any any formations, any kind of cysts that form, any changes on your breast. Because, you know, as a woman, you, I'm sure when we, when we shower, tayo, we look at ourselves in the mirror, I'm sure. And when you see literally the minor changes um, in the shape, the size, the color, the skin kind of um, complex, uh, complexion, um, anything like that um, can indicate that something may be wrong. It may not necessarily be cancer, but that's something worth, Um, you know, going to your doctor, if I check you. Um, testicular, I think it's the same as well. I don't know much about it, but again, um, kind of testing and making sure, checking if there's any changes um, in the kind of color, look, form. Again, it's, it's, it's a good way. Early, as, I, as, as we know with cancer, early, early detection is key. Because as you, you've seen, you know, once the cancer has progressed and metastasized, it's very difficult to track. So mahirap nang habulin pag naka, nakawala na sila sa blood system mo. And the only kind of cure for that essentially is is going back to chemotherapy, the systemic treatment. Again, because um, yeah, they, they've gone haywire on your body na. So again, early detection is key. And yes, self-examination, good. <laughs> All right. Siguro, uh, last two questions. Um, uh, I can, I, can, I can read this one. So this is from Daryl Jade Baluyot. So good morning po. Some articles say that prostate cancer is the friendliest among the cancers that a person may, ha- may have. Is that true po? Friendliest? I think it's, it has the highest curative rate. So on oh. prostate cancer, there are, same as breast, um, there are many, because it's the most common prostate breast, very common so historically you know yung research focused the breast and prostate which is why very early on 1980s pa lang, you know there has been a drug approved for breast and prostate so i think this is why it's been dubbed as the friendliest cancer because there's so much research ongoing and there's a high curative rate for 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 these cancers but you know again early detection is key um, when you detect a cancer late kahit ano cancer ba yan, breast or prostate Um, you know, once it has metastasized, as I keep saying, um, it's very difficult to treat. So again, early detection. All right. Teka, may... May, uh, may... may pahabol. Pahabol. Oo. Oh, oh, uh, 
At eto, may, may nag-request kasi sa akin, si uh, uh, Wellister Manuel. Um, nag- nag- nag-direct message sa akin to include this question. Perhaps we can ask him to... Uh, pwede, gusto mo ba mag-ask ng yung question mo ng live, uh, Wellister, if that's okay? Are you still around? Uh, nandiyan ba? Hello po. Ayan, po. As, as, asan ka? Ayan, ayan siya. <laughs> Hindi ko siya makita. <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, please speak up. Ganda naman ang name niya, Wellister. Okay, okay. Oh, Wellister. Oh, yeah. um, we have different types of cell po according to their ability to divide and proliferate po. Question lang po, possible po ba na ang permanent cells like heart cells and neuron cells ay mag-develop po as cancer cells? Hearts, what is it? Heart cells and? Neurons. Uh, neurons po. So, so heart cells, I don't think, um, I have not heard of a heart or cardiac tumor, but neural cells for sure. Um, many types of tumors, glioma, neuroblastoma. Um, so yeah, brain tumors um, is, is, is a big kind of disease as well. And the challenge, I, I'm sure you'll appreciate the challenge um, in treating brain tumors is for drugs to enter the blood brain barrier. So our brain is kind of covered with this kind of membrane na, um, you know, for, For a normal neuro, it's, it's there to protect the brain. The brain is like one of the most important organs in our body. So it needs to have a membrane to protect it. But the challenge is getting the drugs to enter that brain. So this is how you study you know, bioavailability again, uh, pharmacodynamic, pharmacokinetics, how to get that drug into the brain. But yes, um, neural cells um, definitely can get cancer there. But heart, I have not heard. Um, I don't know why exactly, but I think the, the, the you know, cardio... the heart cells and cardiomyocytes, I think they're so differentiated. They're, they're, they're very active um, as well. So I don't think they can, but I should look into that. Bakit hindi? That's, a, that's another area for research, actually, why you don't get heart cancer. So there must be something in the heart cells that yeah. makes them resistant. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's an area you can look at. Oh, yeah. That's a hypothesis. <laughs> oh yeah, well, Lister, na-trigger mo yung speaker natin. Baka magkakaroon na siya ng bagong area of research. Bagong <laughs> project. Oo, oh, 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 ayan. So speaking of, so, so, so Lori, nakita mo naman yung engagement ng students natin. No? Lots of burning questions and a lot of intelligible questions. No? So if it's any indication, I'm hoping that you know it also, it's also encouraging you of the quality of you know the, uh, young STEM professionals and enthusiasts that we have in the country. So, but siguro ito yung la, ito talaga yung ultimate last question. Uh, may we can we ask you to you know um, send some messages uh, messages of encouragement siguro sa teachers and students of Philippines uh, when it comes to STEM uh, as a career naman and yes. especially those who might actually be uh, taking an, an interest in um, um, getting involved in cancer research for sure definitely you can add me on Facebook if you want <laughs> um, so oh uh, well. Uh, what was I gonna say now? So I think for, for a message for the teachers and, and things like that. So I think for the teachers, in my experience, when I was being taught biology, I think it's just encouragement. And, um, you know, sometimes when you, I ask questions, sometimes the teachers won't know the answer to the question, but, you know, don't just kind of dismiss that. encourage them even if you don't know the answer you know lead them to books or a paper or something like that that hey why don't you look at this um, I don't know the answer but you know why don't you explore and things like that so I think I was I had a teacher who was very um, encouraging and every time I had a question you know she would oh you can see that she would always go out of her way to try and answer a question and if she didn't know She would always like say, refer me to a paper or something like that. Um, what else? Yeah, I think that's it. Just kind of spur the excitement. Yeah, just continue to motivate them and get them to ask questions as well. Like, you know, I think I'm sure in lessons, you, you don't just want to answer it, but, you know, get them to think critically. Like if you have a problem, Um, how would you solve that problem? Don't just give the answer as well. So I think that's how you develop the scientific brain, the critical thinking, how you formulate hypothesis. And the research question is to encourage students to think for themselves and not just 
give away the answer very easily. <laughs> Ayan. Oh yeah, yeah. Essentially, teach them how to fish, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's problem solving. Research is problem solving. Yeah. So if you give them the answer. Yep. S- siguro message din for para sa mga students. Ayan. For the students. Sh- yeah. <laughs> students never give enough. Um, students. Um, I think always be excited. And I think the one thing I always teach my students when I was like um mentoring PhD students is network, network, network. Um, I am like I, I really love network. When I go to conferences or something, I I am the person who would like go go speak to a speaker, talk to someone and like that because you don't know how what your network can do for you. It can find you the lab that you want to work with or that your next job and things like that. So you know, maintain the network, um, stay in touch with the people. I'm still in touch with um, my undergrad teacher, like my first year college teacher. I use him as a reference for my jobs. Um, so again, I think that's one thing I always say people, network, network, because you never know. I, I know a story, like um, a colleague of mine um, met someone at the on the plane, I think on coming back from a conference. Um, she, they got chatting. That was, um, I think two weeks later, the guy um, contacted her saying, you know, I, I heard about your research and you want the job. So, you know, the, again, maintain your network because you don't know. Ayan. So, again, kapal na mukha. So, no. Kapal na mukha lang. Ayan. Ayan, ayan, ayan. All right. So, um, at this point, uh, yeah, JP has something to present. Okay. Let me just... Can you see it now? Um, yeah. Yep. Right. So, in behalf of... Uh, All of us here at Filipino Science Hub, uh, we would like to present this certificate of appreciation because that's all that we can give for now. <laughs> Glory, so sana, sana magkita-kita tayo in the future uh, to yep. Dr. Glory and uh, Duike Lazaro uh, for delivering this webinar, Yes, and Nuances of Cancer Drug Discovery, organized by the Filipino Science Hub and held via Zoom and YouTube Live on this 23rd day of April 2022. Signed, Dr. Jeffrey Bonkin, CEO and founder of Filipino Science Hub and yours truly, um, head of research, Filipino Science Hub. Yeah. So, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I really like the questions. Um, very, we have uh, 300. Yeah, we have 300. Uh, thank you. Yeah, and, and thank you so much. We have we actually have 300 live participants today. So you have touched the lives of 300 educators and students and um uh, essentially STEM enthusiasts. So maraming maraming salamat, Glory, and we're hoping that this is uh, not going to be the last. So hope uh sana ma invite ka pa namin for other for other, you know, like um information and knowledge sharing activities sa Filipino Science Hub. And I know for sure na meron kang mga na-inspire na students today to venture into cancer research just like Joshua I, I know <laughs> thank you so much thank you so at this point po, <laughs> yeah and so um we have re- we have shared the link po para doon sa um, certificate um and uh, nasa Zoom chat box yan at saka po nasa YouTube um chat box uh yeah so um ilalagay din po namin yan sa YouTube um anyways So, Glory, we would also like to invite you for a very quick debrief after this in a separate uh, Zoom session. So, um, Tadala ko sa'yo sa Messenger, Glory. Ayan, ayan. So, oh, again, okay. yeah, again, so uh, almost 12.30 na in the afternoon in the Philippines. So, maraming maraming salamat po sa muli ninyong pagsama sa amin. Sa mga Thank you very much, Hubbers. Yep. Tomorrow. Tomorrow is the career guidance session. So, kung maging entrepreneurs, uh, startup company uh, uh, um, leads, uh, educators, researchers, uh, we have a couple of very inspiring stories for you. All right. Maraming maraming salamat po ulit sa inyo. Magkita-kita po tayo bukas. And then, Glory, we'll see you in the other meeting session. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.